Thanks a lot, Nicole, and thanks uh, everyone for coming, despite the weather. Um, so I've got a fairly long and ungainly introduction um, and where I'm going to kind of try and set the scene a little bit historically and uh, talk us about some of the questions that I'm interested in before moving on to the kind of meat of the uh, talk. So if you just bear with me for the, just at the beginning. Um, Speak a little bit louder. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in 1939, um, the president of the first school ever conceived uh, that was devoted to an education in planning, um, Eric Rouse, gave a speech in front of the Town Planning Institute in London. And his uh, basic message was that uh, today we face death as surely as if one held a knife at our throat. Whether it be peace or war, it's nevertheless death. And this is a kind of striking example, but I think a fairly typical um, indication of how people felt in Britain between the wars, and particularly people concerned with town planning, which was a theory and a practice that attempted to make sense of its historical moment, being the first half of the 20th century, a period which was heavy with what Roxanne Panchese, historian, has called uh, cultures of anticipation. This is, these are cultures in which mass societies urbanisation, rapid technological change, not least new technologies of war, were read as marking a decisive, sudden and irreversible shift away from the past and into an unknown future. Uh, and to illustrate this, I'm just going to take an early diversion. Um, in Virginia Woolf's final novel, Between the Acts, which was published shortly after her suicide in 1941, this shift into the unknown is described by her as an unsettling of relationships between things uh, it, and it reveals a profound contemporary anxiety about discord, disharmony, conflict and uncertainty. It's uh, an ag a atomization and fragmentation. Uh, in the novel, a strange play which is itself a kind of mess of the different the theatrical styles is staged in the grounds of an English country house set as the kind of last refuge from modernity. And throughout the staging of this play, different external elements from animals in nearby fields to cars passing by, planes overhead, and a gramophone that ticks constantly in the bushes interrupt and clash in a confusion of noise and things, while the audience become increasingly uneasy. Quote, Mrs. Swiving caressed her cross, she gazed vaguely at the view. She was off, they guessed, on a circular tour of the imagination, one making. Sheep, cows, grass, trees, ourselves, all are one. If discordant, producing harmony. If not to us, to a gigantic ear attached to a gigantic head. And thus, the agony of the particular sheep, cow or human being is necessary. And so, we reach the conclusion that all is harmony, could we hear it. And we shall. Her eyes now rested on the white summit of a cloud. Well, if the thought gave her comfort, let her think it. And then later, all their nerves were on edge. They sat exposed, the machine ticked, there was no music. The horns of cars on the road were heard, and the swish of trees. They were neither one thing nor the other, neither Victorians nor themselves. They were suspended without being and in limbo. Tick, tick, tick went the machine. So here you have this ticking machine and the sounds of the car horns and the trees swishing in the wind coming together to create an alliance of disharmony and unknowability. Everything's held in stasis and in anticipation while the machine ticks on relentless in a different temporal register. And I refer to this feeling and this cultural condition because it's in this anxious paralysis, this confusion of elements that planners set out to tackle. They engaged in imagined one making just as Mrs. Swiven does in the novel but sought to take these imaginings out of mind and into the material reality of everyday life through buildings, streets and roads. And while Wolfe, in a novel, takes this confusion of elements out of the city and into the uh, rural country house, for the most part it was conceived as an urban problem. Um, in The Culture of Cities, Lewis Mumford said that the met metropolis is rank with forms of what he called negative vitality. He described how a ruinous mental condition resulted from this kind of living. In this mangled state, he wrote, the impulse to live departs from the apparently healthy personalities as it might depart from someone who's been crushed under the wheels of a locomotive. 
the impulse to die supplants it. And just as the will to live can triumph over all but catastrophic accidents or derangements to the physical organism, so the will to die can eat cancerously into the personality, until the body itself, no matter how outwardly healthy, is tainted and finally consumed by the malady. And so, again, the image of the locomotive reflects how technologies, and particularly technologies concerned with travel and automated movement, were interpolated into discourses about the mechanisation of life that threatened to crush humans in these kind of gears of progress and technological change. The sense of cities as a site of mass movement and flux, of human and inhuman objects hurtling around always on the verge of collision, had already been highlighted by Gil Simmel before the First World War, where he wrote in The Metropolis of Mental Life that the relationships of activi and activities of metropolitan inhabitants uh, intertwine with one another into a many-membered organism. In view of this fact, he continued, the lack of the most exact punctuality in promises and performances would cause the whole to break down into inextricable chaos. So here the city is characterised as an organism, but one that has to function as a machine in order to be stable and continue. In the same address uh, quoted at the start here, Rouse likened the modern city to a complicated machine, and simultaneously contemporaries compared urban growth in Britain to an octopus unfurling its arms and suffocating the countryside. And I think what connects these ideas is the insistence on the importance of the relationships between things above all else. And I think we can maybe talk about this as a site of emergence for ideas about systems and ecologies being applied to understandings of human societies and the development of history. Part of this analysis then is concerned with the genealogies of ideas expressed by people like Gregory Bateson, who wrote in 1972, um, later was the epigraph for uh, Guattari's Free Ecologies essay, that there's an ecology of bad ideas just as there's an ecology of weeds, and it's characteristic of the system that basic error propagates itself. It branches out like a rooted parasite through the tissue of life, and everything gets into a rather peculiar mess. Bateson draws together biology, anthropology, ecology, cybernetics, and psychiatry in his work, and this was manifested in his understanding of evolution that moved away from Darwinian ideas of fitness of the individual organism to stress the importance of interactions between organism and environment. For Bateson, the unit of survival was organism plus environment. And in this post-war conception of evolutionary survival, I think it's foreshadowed in planning and architecture between the war, where the construction of an equilibrium between mankind and environment was perceived quite literally as a matter of life and death. A good town plan, as Foucault said, takes into account precisely what might happen. It's an intervention designed to shape the future, to engineer, design and build the rails along which human societies can travel forward. It's concerned with evolution, projections and expectations. It requires data, information and speculations about contemporary societies in order to construct imaginary future ones. And it's in this way that it determines what might happen and plans either for or against that. And I'll be trying to talk about some of the implications in this foreseeing and then attempting to plot the path to the future. Specifically, I'm asking how did these attempts to shape the future environment require people themselves to be reshaped, corners smoothed, creases ironed, to better synchronise themselves with their environment in a view of the world that was increasingly about systems and the interactions between elements rather than the elements themselves. By asking this, I'm attempting to explore how the impact of war on cultural visions of the future and ask questions about how ideas of evolutionary patterns of adaptability and survival contributed to an understanding of the philosophy of history that sought to make sense of a period of intense upheaval and violence by relegating the past and privileging evolutionary concepts of change. The British modernist architect Coates, Wells Coates wrote in 1931 that as young men we're concerned with a future which must be planned rather than past which must be patched up at all costs. As architects of the ultimate human and material scenes of the new order, we're not so much concerned with the formal problems of style as with an architectural solution to the social and economic problems of today. And by discussing some examples of architectural solutions after the First World War and into the Second, I aim to contextualise design within discourses of modernity to complicate the interactions of modernism with welfare and social control. Uh, running throughout all of this, are developing ideas about human behaviour, its 
potential predictability and how an understanding of the relationships between people and their environments influence conduct. And I'm going to talk about some examples of this one making and attempt to make some connections with developments in cybernetics in Britain whilst highlighting how essentially humane attempts to build conflict out of societies framed freedom as dependent on a given determined version of order. But I'm going to start with a building which I think reflects quite nicely the belief among British modern architects in the period that social pro progress could be achieved through scientific design and technological innovation. Where the destructiveness of war had remedied by planning an appeal could, offered rem could offer a remedy sorry, by planning an appeal to ideas about adaptability and the possibility for a harmon harmonious relationship between people and their built environment. Um, so the first case study is St Dunstan's. Um, this was a convalescent hospital built for blind and veterans of war uh, and it demonstrates how destruction and disorder were tackled by modernist functional design in Britain. St Dunstan's were building designed as a place of treatment, leisure and convalescence in which men could learn to live in a new way, adapt to their new circumstances and alter altered abilities. And in the words of the chairman of St Dunstan's, learn to be blind. Um, and just while I kind of introduce it, I have uh, old footage of the uh, a royal um, visiting in 1950, which is a bit after what I'm talking about, but you can get an idea of how the building worked. Um, so this building was designed to fac facilitate successful adaptation by enabling recently blinded men to relearn to live, precisely by training, in, training them in new techniques of living, which were dependent on their interactions with the physical environment of the building. It was constructed on the premise that rational planning would result in rational social conduct. And with this building, we begin to illustrate how ideas are expressed through architecture in an attempt to create the material framework for rational living, which equated to peaceful living. And again, we can track Bateson's ecological argument that evolutionary survival is achieved by organism in, in environment here. Um, it was built between 1936 and 1938 at Ovindine in Sussex, which is on the south coast, uh, on the cliffs on the south coast near Brighton. And it's still there. Um, it's still a charity functioning under the same basic purpose to help uh, ex-servicemen and women who have been blinded in war. But it's now called Blind Veterans UK which is a bit more Google friendly than St Dunstan's, I think. Um, but it, I mean, the charity was first established in the First World War in London and this, and it was originally run out of Regent's Park and this was their kind of first home. Um, it was designed by Francis Lorne, an architect from Falkirk who'd spent some time in New York, Paris and Canada before returning to Britain in 1930. And he kind of, although he's Scottish, he kind of comes at the same time as the wave of um, emigre architects, particularly from Germany and Europe, who arrived in Britain in the 1930s. Um, he defined the job of the architect as being to, quote, steamroll ugliness, to search for order and beauty in every department of life, and having found them, to spread them as far over and as far into society, to remake society, in fact, as much as it's possible for us to do in our day. He believed in the ability of modern architecture to change how people acted and lived, and he and, St. Dunst and the St Dunstan's charity believed that a well-designed environment would significantly help men to learn to live with blindness. He wrote in 1935 that our life is in a continual state of flux and therefore in continual need of restatement. He argued that architecture is so closely related to living that a statement of architecture is practically a statement of our country and a statement of humankind. Architecture then was a structure set against the chaos of life and war and modernity that could make society, remake society and be a statement of humankind. Uh, and it's with this in mind that I think St Dunstan's is such a clear example of the de desire to correct disorder and conflict through planning and design. As with the brief discussion earlier on with the uh, talk about discourses of disorder in cities, um, a key factor in the St Dunstan's plan was facilitating movement through space while avoiding conflicts, collisions and congestion. As a way of trying to focus this and make it a bit more concrete, I'm just going to pick out a couple of design features from the building 
that reflect this concern. Um, these are things generally that seem pretty commonplace to us now, but at the time they were understood in relation to this need to have ordered movement. Uh, first of all, St Dunstan's was designed to have as few corners as possible, and, but this idea, in order to, that was in order to enable free movement, of course, but this idea of free movement was very much a planned movement along paths that were plotted into the building and then built into its architecture. The Journal of the Royal Institute of British Architects wrote, focused on the design of the doors which were able to swing one way only um, and the rounding of all projecting wall corners to quote, minimise the risk of blind people running into sharp obstacles. Design features like this were aimed at creating a building that would enable circulation along fixed planned routes with the pa patients travelling through the building as if on rails. And included in the architectural write-up um, was this circulation diagram, which reflects how important circulation was in, the, in conceiving the plan and design of the building. Um, in terms of the actual material of the building itself, probably the most important way that this idea of circulation was built into design was through a handrail um, which was picked up on in both the architectural press and the more mainstream media as being a particularly important innovation in architecture and design. The Observer newspaper commented on it saying that the handrail system enabled a man to be safely guided to his own room, warned of doorways and other approaching dangers by means of studs let into the rail. And there aren't really any good photos that I've been able to find of the rail. But here you can see it. You can't see the studs let into it um, or anything like that. And you can also see the doors that only open one way. Um, so this, uh, this rail then acts a, as a kind of track, transporting the residents through the building, advising them of where they're going and what they would encounter. The handrail also reflects how the most seemingly mundane aspects of design had significance and the building was envis envisaged as a complete functioning mechanism with patients as another part of the board of design. It was through interaction with the material of the building that it worked for the patients. The then chairman of St Dunstan's, Conservative MP Sir and then later Lord Ian Fraser, who himself was blinded by a bullet in the First World War, stressed the importance of planned routes of circulation when work began on the new building. He told journalists that it had been sp specially de designed so there were no corridors, steps or awkward corners. The result of ordered planning was that, according to Fraser, once a blinded man has learned his way about one room, he will know the way about all of them. He can get about to an extraordinary degree and he loves this independence. And here again we have this idea of independence and freedom that's connected to the functioning of the built environment through its interaction with the people who live there. The patient has to adapt to the environment and then he achieves a kind of independence that itself is built into the plan. Uh, the idea of obstacle free move movement was extended to the furniture and built in furniture and the effective use of space were key features in the design. Um, this is an example of some built in furniture which I'll just explain. Uh, in St Dunstan's, the wardrobes and tables and radiators were all built into these casings at the back of the beds which could then be pulled out and pushed back in. Um, but this emphasis on built-in furniture wasn't unique to a uh, building for blind people. Uh, Wells Coates again incorporated this into his flat designs in the 1930s and explained it uh, by saying that we need a new approach to furniture. Uh, a modern life required freedom from the enslaving and fulsome encumbrances that traditional furniture represented. Um, and it, the plan also made attempts for collision between patients, or tried to uh, make uh, collisions between patients less likely in the bathroom. Um, as the architectural review wrote, a typical lavatory in which unusually large circulating space is provided to minimise the risk of collision between inmates. Um, why they say inmates, I'm not entirely sure, but you get the, you get the impression about collision. Uh, and I think it's sig significant that these ideas are applied to a convalescent hospital for blind people, 
as it demonstrates how important intrinsically rational design and the ordering of space were in planning. The functionality of the plan was such that even people lacking sight could quickly grasp the design and learn to use the building in the way the plan envisioned. Violence and destruction had taken sight from the patients and the ordered planning of the building worked to negate this loss by appealing to a sense of inherent rationalism and adaptability. You can, still, you can lose your main sense and you'd still be able to function in the building. The idea was that the, the relationship between the people and the building would be a performative one. They'd learn, they'd learn and adapt and then follow the built patterns of the building in order to carry out tasks and simply to live. The, functioning, the processing function of site was replaced by a physical interaction with the architecture of the building itself. As well as techniques for navigation of the building, the emphasis placed on efficiency was reiterated in the techniques used to train the patients to live with their blindness in broader ways. Um, the Manchester Guardian wrote in August 1933, before this building was built, that the, uh, an article called Efficiency, Efficiency One, which detailed how St Dunstan's put great stress on rules and personal discipline in order, in order to, quote, psychologically tone the patient up. Um, this was equated with efficiency for effective training and the right balance between lessons and recrea recreation. And as the video showed, um, production and training the men to function in the workplace was a key, uh, key interest of the charity. But it was also evident in re recreation, as this video from 1950 shows. An electric coil causes oscillation, conveyed to the marksman on headphones. By it, he tells whether he's on the target. And here's the reason for it all. There are men of St. Dunstan who do not believe in letting their troubles get them down. Instructor Sturgeon takes great pains with his pupils so that they can get the satisfaction that a good score brings. The rifle is an Army 303 with a sleeved 2-2 barrel. So, here goes. It's an ingenious idea and one that gives great pleasure and interest to these sightless men who, by means of this simple electrical device, can still get all the fun that's going. Here's Fred Barrett of Cardiff, ex-Navy. Having a go and according to Instructor Sturgeon, it's amazing what scores these boys succeed in knocking up. So that the men can judge their accuracy for themselves, the card is placed in a press after shooting and the target rings are in bust. The men's sensitive fingers can thus tell them the result. In every sense of the phrase, we'd like to say, Good shooting, St. Dunstan's. So, yeah, I, d I mean, I don't really know what to say about that video. It's kind of, seems kind of strange to me. Um, but basically, you can take away that as touch enabled the men to use the handrail to negotiate the building, they invented another device, which meant that they could still practice their marksmanship um, and get satisfaction that a good score brings. Uh, and to do this you have this electrical device which facilitates a new way of aiming that's based on sound and not sight and the men then adapt to this enabled uh, in order to be able to carry on shooting. For the residents of St Dunstan's an appeal to inherent rationalism and an effectively planned and built environment was a way to achieve harmony which echo contemporary discourses of mechanisation, functionalism and modernity. Uh, so Dunstan's reflects the resonance of ideas about adaptability and the, and the importance of achieving some kind of synthesis between organism and environment, where the two work in concert to bring about a peaceful equilibrium to correct the destructiveness of human societies. The historical context and the reformist arguments within which these ideas were seeped highlights the importance of anxieties about decay and the need to survive. And it's in this context that I make a bit of a, bit of a leap um, and I'm going to talk a bit about British cybernetician Grey Walter and his tortoise machines.
Um, Walter's tortoise is one of the milestones in the development of robotics, art artificial intelligence and cybernetics. Uh, he built the first two at his home in 1948 and 1949. Uh, and Andrew Pickering has written a lot about this and I'm just going to paraphrase his description of the tortoises. Um, they had two back wheels and one front, a battery powered electric motor which drove the front wheel causing the tortoise to move forward and another motor caused the front forks to rotate on their axis. If the tortoise hit an obstacle, a contact switch on the body would set the machine into a back and forth oscillation, which would usually be enough to get it away from the obstacle. Um, on the front fork, it had a photocell, which, when it detected a source of light, uh, moved towards it. Um, but better than that description, here's a short video from YouTube. <laughs> In a simple villa on the outskirts of Bristol lives Dr. Gray Walter, a neurologist, who makes robots as a hobby. They are small, and he doesn't dress them up to look like men. He calls them tortoises. And so cunningly have their insides been designed that they respond to the stimuli of light and touch in a completely lifelike manner. cell which rotates above her body. When light strikes the cell, driving and steering mechanism sends her hurrying towards it. If she brushes against any object in her path, contacts are operated that turn the steering away, and so automatically she takes avoiding action. Yeah, <laughs> so um, as you can see, the tortoises functioned by performatively exploring their environment, guided by light and then reacting to collisions. Um, in his first published article on tortoises in Scientific American in 1950, Walter wrote that these machines illustrate particularly the exploratory speculative behaviour that's so characteristic of most animals. Uh, in this article, an imitation of life, he frequently used language that applies biological, animal and human characteristics to his tortoise machines. They were, he wrote, perhaps the simplest machines that can be said to resemble animals. Crude though they are, they give an eerie impression of purposefulness, independence and spontaneity. The crudeness was, however, a deliberate choice. Uh, Walter said that he deliberately restricted the number of components to two in order to discover what degree of complexity of behaviour and independence could be achieved with the smallest number of elements connected in a system. Walter wasn't interested in a very sophisticated machine that processed vast, am vast amounts of information, but was interested in one that would perform a given function efficiently. And in doing this, he affirmed the importance of the relationships between the object and its environment. Something only exists in, it in its environment, and so by finding or building some kind of harmony between the two, you could have this uh, equilibrium. And again we return here to Bateson's insistence on the evolutionary paradigm of organism plus environment equals survival. The tortoises were successful insofar as they were able to adapt to their environment and function efficiently to an acceptable level. It was the ability of the tortoises to avoid collisions or conflicts with other objects in their environment 
and follow the path of light that determine their su successful adaptive behaviour. Walter wrote, when the creature makes contact with an obstacle, all stimuli are ignored and its gait is transformed into a succession of butts, withdrawals and sidesteps until the interference is either pushed aside or circumvented. The ability to avoid contact overwrote the primary stimulus response nature of the tortoises and light. And in a strange way, the tortoises reflect the image of living in dense cities drawn by Simmel. In cities, Simmel wrote that there's a slight aversion and a mutual strangeness and repulsion, which in close contact has arisen any way, whatever, can break out into hatred and conflict. There's essentially a danger in density. And in order to avoid potential collision, which in the culture of mid-century was connected to fears of war, decline, or even revolution, the tortoises had to constantly communicate with their environment. But it's important to remember that, that this was a response to a stimulus and the adaptive behaviour displayed by the tortoises enabled them to move around without creating any kind of inner representation of their worlds. It's performative, it acts, it doesn't think. It's an uncovering and entraining of natural responses that might otherwise drift into disorder. As Bateson said to an audience of psychiatrists at a conference on mental health in 1969, the circuits and balances of nature can only too easily get out of kilter. And they inevitably get out of kilter when certain basic errors of thought become reinforced by thousands of cultural details. So cultural details, external information, bad ideas threaten the stability of mind and the balance of nature. This is what psychiatrists come cybernetic cyberneticists like Grey Walter Ross Ashby and then Gregory Bateson were interested in. And this is, I think, what the St Dunstan's building attempted to do for people who had lost their primary sense of movement through s and negotiation through, sp through space, their sight. Through interaction with the environment, they could rediscover function and stability. While the tortoise was led around a room with a torch, the rail communicated the equivalent information to the men in St Dunstan's. They couldn't see, but they could still communicate with the building or receive signals from the rails and the studs built into them. Likewise, Walter's tortoise doesn't see its scans. And I think it could be interesting to approach a kind of constant performative adaptation on, along planned and determined routes in St Dunstan's along these lines. Um, and it's by thinking about scanning that it's a process of uncovering hidden patterns and the performative reaction to environment that was about function, efficiency and order that we come back to planning as we move out of a building and into a macro scale. The idea of scanning that Walter developed, along with his sometime colleague, the experimental psychologist Kenneth Craik, was built from speculations about a basic cerebral scanning mechanism. Pickering describes the basic idea as being that the brain contains some such scanning mechanism which constantly scans over its sensory inputs for features of interest, objects or patterns in the world, or configurations internal to itself. And the tortoise demonstrates this with the front forks rotating and the photo cell looking for light. Um, and it's thereby performing something akin to a brain scanning function. Uh, Pickering tells a story of how Craig visited Walter in the summer of 1944, and they both became drawn to the idea that brain waves were somehow the brain's integral scanning mechanism. Um, they supposed that the basic alpha rhythm of brain waves, which stopped when the eyes opened, could be interpreted as a search of visual information, a search, quote, which relaxes when a pattern is found. So just like the tortoise's photocell stops rotating when it finds light, or the men in St Dunstan's when they read the handrail. It's this idea of searching for patterns that I want to relate to planning and its roots in ecology, biology and botany, and its extension into war and imperialism. One of the defining books for the more visionary planners in the first half of the 20th century, and still quite influential today, was written by Scottish biologist and sociologist Patrick Geddes. His major book written before the First World War was called Cities and Evolution, and in this he argues for what he called the survey and plan method to be used in town planning in order to tie together a biological understanding with a sociological one. Planning in cities and regions for Geddes was the practical application of sociology. He considered cities as made as a s of series of interlocking units and an interwoven structure, which with his biological background he likened to the structure of a flower, but also to technologies of the period, and specifically the loom. In the first pages of the culture of, uh, in Cities and Evolution, he wrote, 
Not a building of his city, but is sounding as with innumerable looms, each of its manifold warp of circumstance, its chain, changeful weft of life. The patterns here seem simple, they're intricate, often mazy beyond out unravelling. All are well nigh and changing, even day by day as we watch. Nay, these very webs are themselves anew caught up to serve as threads again, within new and vaster combinations. Yet within this labyrinthine civi complex there are no mere spectators. Blind or seeing, inventive or unthinking, joyous or unwilling, each has still to weave in, ill or well, and for worse, if not for better, the whole thread of his thread. And this quote demonstrates how a biological and sociological view was passed through the cultural context of the period and likened to the fast-moving functionalism of a loom. This was less a retreat into nature than a mechanisation of nature. Nature and machine weave patterns that are forever changing, but nevertheless have a permanency, and mankind must adapt to survive. Again, this prompts us to recall the men in St Dunstan's and the charities aim to enable men <coughs> blinded by war to weave themselves back into society, to recover efficiency and a quality of life, as well as productive potential. And as John Adam and Edmund Ramson have argued, for architects, nature as a model offered not decorative shapes to copy over, but a method of organisation. The webs of the environment, natural or built, that Getty's sociological understanding of human societies was framed by. And as he says, each still has to weave in. Each is inextricably bound into environment. And stability can only come from a harmonious relationship between elements, from one making. An order based on the constant observation of the environment through surveys and then human societies constructed in relation to that environment could, chee could achieve harmony and peace. And just as the dis discovery of order that entrained nature and mobilised the innate was in explained in the name of post-war welfare in St Dunstan's, so architects saw broader applications and implications. Wells Coates again wrote that it's for architects to realise the possibilities of our lives now in an age of science when life could almost immediately become free, that is to say, ordered and refined for all classes. It's this question of freedom and order that comes up again when you track the work of planners following Geddes and relate this more broadly to questions about evolution, history and planning the future. If we come back to the Foucault line about how town planning is concerned with precisely what might happen, we can think again about visions of order in nature and evolution in history amongst planners and people who lived through this period of war and destruction. And I'm going to move towards the end by thinking about how, in the context of war, chaos, fear and anxiety, the law of a natural order and peaceful equilibrium itself threatened to enact more violence in the name of peace, nature and order. Uh, planners working in the tradition of Patrick Geddes proposed remedies for reconstruction after the Second World War that now seem closer to war and peace. And a document by Rouse, who I started with at the beginning, um, while he, written while he was on active service, I think in North Africa in 1943, illustrates this markedly. In his document entitled The Proportion of Population to Potential, a programme for the reconstruction of, of the British Commonwealth of Nations, he argued that his envisioned ongoing wars of resettlement could only be challenged by an ordered balance of population across the globe. He proposed <coughs> order to correct disorder and a controlled transformation in the hope of peace. The ecological and biological roots of his Geddes-inspired worldview helped foster his conviction that a natural equilibrium could be found and constructed and the environment thus reclaimed from conflict. In order to avert future war, Rouse proposed a radical redistribution of British people across the Commonwealth nations. His vision required an acceptance by British people of what he called the way of abnegation. He hoped <coughs> that the privations of war had inculcated a feeling of sacrifice and mutual assistance that would have to be harnessed if, if Britain were to be reconstructed and deprivation and future war avoided. There are many signs, he wrote, that suffering in comradeship is once again teaching them the lesson of abnegation, learned so painfully between 1914 and 1918, and so soon forgotten. Rouse's plan was constructed around the full, deployment of res the full development of resources of Commonwealth nations and the distribution of population, quote, in saner relationship to natural resources. He described the two central, central elements, population and resources, as entirely interconnected. He was seeking a sustainable balance, equilibrium between population, production and environment. In order to achieve this, he proposed a dramatic pruning of the British population to open space at home and allow renewal and growth while British immigrants would cultivate the Commonwealth. 
His desire to, quote, put bellies near food, put hands near work, amounted to a reduction of the contemporary population to between 20 million and 25 million, which is about half of what it was in the 1940s, and said that this had to be completed before 1970. Rouse's analysis was informed by the expectation that population in Britain would continue the perceived downward trend of the years before the war, and a planned reduction would enable him to order the decline and, anou and allow national revitalisation while spreading its influence more effectively across the globe. And you can see in this idea of ordered pruning that it's a kind of botanical, has roots in botany. Um, he argued that if you could achieve this, recovery in a healthy economic condition would follow. The implementation of his plan, um, it, would be with, it would be with people that Britain would develop the Commonwealth, he argued, or in his words, it would be with Britain's lifeblood that she would feed her daughters. The need to enforce controls on the future, to build the rails upon which human societies would travel, was at the centre of his ideas. Here his wartime experience and the intense anxiety about yet more destruction to come seems to have brought him to thinking that would surely contradict Getty's principle of town planning being not place planning or work planning, but what he called folk planning, which meant not coercing people into a new place, but rather finding the right places for people so that they would, to quote Geddes, really flourish, to give people in fact the same care that we give when transplanting flowers, instead of half evi harsh evictions and arbitrary instructions to move on delivered in the manner of an officious policeman. For else, the officious policeman was the planner or architect made necessary by the expectation of conflict and the perceived proliferation of disorder. An officious manner would be necessary for any successful one-making to, to be brought out of Mrs. Scriven's imagination and into the environment. So to conclude, um, the desire to create harmonious relationships amongst human societies and within the natural landscape after the Second World War was in part an attempt to propose a moment of pastoral in opposition to the destruction of war. But where Geddes had written of transplanting people with the same care as transplanting flowers, which of course is itself still very problematic, um, Rouse's moment of pastoral was even more evidently violent. And I'm not interested in condemning him here, but rather trying to indicate how the impacts of war, the impact of war on, ide on ideas about planning the future. And I'd say that even though his ideas seem absurd, we should take them seriously. He said that dead comrades always live on my mind, and he saw violence as a product of disorder that could only be properly addressed by re physically reordering the world for, for efficiency. But his synoptic vision of human societies and their relationships to the natural environment, saw them, which saw them as systems, obscured the fact that his propositions involved the forced relocation of millions of people. Similarly, the destruction of war was embodied in the patients at St Dunstan's and the architectural solution to this was a planned order that was designed to enable a new way of living but required the routes of travel to be fixed. The men followed paths through the building as Walter's tortoise followed his torch, each function in a way that depended on interaction with their environment. But these innovations brought in a period of anxiety and war required a view of societies in which people were rendered moving parts in an architectural biological mechanism. Editor of the Architectural Review, J.M. Richards, observed in 1935 how through orderly design and planning, the complicated organisation of modern society approached the calculated rhythms of a machine. He argued that as a consequence of the mechanical understanding of these rhythms of life, examples of, quote, nonconformity of parts of the new order with the whole would become unbearable. In this vision of the future, circulation through buildings and cities was to be plotted along specific routes that had been determined as the most efficient, like the movement of air through an engine or a bee through its hive. And Richard called this a rational aesthetic. The individual had been reduced to an object in motion, one that would adapt to the environment performatively by actually moving about it and not by thinking about it. If clear routes of travel offered a kind of independence and freedom, it also suggested the submission of the individual to authority, a given collective purpose and the necessary exclusion of things deemed unbearable. Despite concerns about the dehumanising effect of technological advancement, for the people I've spoken about today, the mechanisation of life promised a new freedom. After industrialisation, urbanisation and war, rational and functional design offered an image of a peaceful society in which conflict had been built out of its social landscape. 
metaphors taken from nature and technology were articulated in modern buildings, which proposed a rationalised vision of an effective functioning of society through the economic use of energy. But Justus Strauss was, I think, an, uh, an unhappy citizen of a war state whose work was always pressed through this lens. He reflects perhaps a broader historical dynamic in which warfare and welfare are increasingly interconnected in development and planning. New national infrastructures of welfare and health developed in response to mass violence and war, but functioned as remedies that depoliticised the broader political, cultural and economic forces that led to war. This was a kind of evolutionary adaptability, a correction to disorder in war, which obscured political questions and constructed systems that obscured their inner workings. Canetti wrote that a soldier is like a prisoner who's adapted himself to the walls enclosing him, one who does not mind a prisoner and fights against his confinement so little that the prison walls actually affect his shape. Whilst other pr prisoners have only, fought, have only one thought, which is to climb these walls or somehow break through them, he, the soldier, accepts them as part of nature, natural surroundings to which he adapts himself and in which the end become part of him. And in this spirit, I'll finish just by saying that I think making natural of cultural conditions and the relegation of history to revolution is likely to make soldiers out of prisoners. Thank you.